Russian war in Ukraine has been going on for 8 years, but we already call it antique. Not only because of Russian soldiers' equipment, no, but because of the number of myths circling around this war. So we have chosen 10 of the most popular myths about Russian war in Ukraine and decided to debunk them. Share this video with your friends if you want to save them from the Russian propaganda and prevent the world from becoming this. And also, do not forget to subscribe to our channel, like the video and everything else. Pope is questioning the war's causes, saying the Kremlin was provoked by the quote, barking of NATO at Russia's door. People who believe in the myth that NATO provoked Russia need to open the map. Russia shares borders with NATO since 2004, when Estonia and Latvia joined the alliance. For all these years, such a close presence of NATO didn't provoke any war, because the Kremlin knows that they are not threatened by the alliance. As for now, Finland, who borders Russia, also declared entry in NATO, and Russia doesn't seem to be bothered by that. Putin sees no threat from NATO expansion. President Vladimir Putin said on Monday that there was no threat to Russia if Sweden and Finland joined NATO. So what's the difference with Ukraine? Maybe NATO built military bases in Ukraine or placed their ballistic missiles in Kharkiv. No, no they didn't, didn't. unfortunately. unfortunately. Russia doesn't see threat from NATO, it sees threat from only seemingly weaker democratic countries. So NATO provoked Russia only with their hesitation. The thing is that Russia has been questioning the Ukrainian language, culture, independence and even our nation's right to exist for several centuries. Russians have always perceived Ukraine as part of their empire and they started a war just to make their dreams come true. They don't need any additional reason to attack Ukraine, except of the Ukraine's existence. The phrase Russia attacks Ukraine because of NATO is the same as Russia attacks Ukraine because of sky or strawberry ice cream or Freddie Mercury in the sky with strawberry ice cream. Former U.S. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger is drawing major backlash from remarks that he made about Ukraine at the World Economic Forum. Kissinger suggested that Ukraine cede territory to make peace with Ukraine, with Russia. Some people who miss history classes about the start of World War II really believe that you can satisfy a crazy dictator by giving away another country's territory. But they should know that trying to achieve peace in this way is like calming down a serial killer by letting him kill several more people. Come here, Ted Bundy, kill a bit more women. That's how international law works now. But this is just history from 80 years ago. Different people, different dictators, different regimes. Where's the empirical evidence, you would ask? We actually have one. Russia already occupied Donetsk, Luhansk and Crimea in 2014, eight years before the full-scale invasion of February 22. Ukraine got almost zero military support from the West, so it wouldn't provoke Putin. Great plan, I heard it somewhere. Guess how it ended? That's right, because their goal is all of Ukraine. The largest ground war in Europe in decades. Here's a look at where the explosions have been heard around Ukraine. But even if you are dumb enough thinking ceding territory will solve the problem, it will not bring peace to occupied regions. The civilians under occupation are always facing murders, rape and discrimination committed by Russians. You saw this in Bucha, Izum, Liman and many other cities you might heard of in the news. This is called genocide, not peace, or Russian world, as Russians call it. Before this war began, and I think this was one of the things that Vladimir Putin was counting on, there were deep divides here. There were divides between East and West. There were divides between uh, those who spoke Russian and those who speak uh, native Ukrainian. One of the main myths which Russian propaganda is spreading throughout these years is that Russia invaded Ukraine to defend the Russian-speaking population, lives here and wants to join Russia, apparently. As an old Russian proverb says, the best defense is to commit genocide. As an argument, they are using a voting map from 2010 presidential election in Ukraine. No, sorry, that's that's US like from up. You can't occupy US because of division, right? Oh, and that's Britain, can occupy. That's Spain, no occupation. Italy, no, no, haram. And that's Ukraine. Please, occupy. The colorized map leaves you no choice. So back in 2010, Putin's friend Viktor Yanukovych was one of the candidates in the presidential election in Ukraine. And actually Yanukovych wasn't actually pro-Russian, but played with sympathies towards friendship with Russia. Big difference, you know, between being sympathetic and publicly advocating for Russian occupation, you know. Yanukovych was a deeply Ukrainian politician with conservative anti-liberal values. What was deeply Russian in his personality, he was incredibly stupid, but still won the election with 48% of votes and did not declare the annihilation of the Ukrainian state or joining Russia. He became a Ukrainian president, publicly using Ukrainian language. His electorate was mainly from the southeastern part of Ukraine and it gave soil for manipulation about a divided country. Harrison was considered 
the closest to Russia. Um, as is as was Mariupol. Yanukovych fled from Ukraine in 2014 because of protests against his policy. He was about to sign an association with the European Union, which was supported by the vast majority of Ukrainians, and then he literally took the money from Russia and decided to sign a trade union with Russia instead. Ukrainians did not like the idea and started to protest. Protests were taking place all over the country, including so-called Russian-speaking regions. <laughs> During 2019, none of the pro-Russian politicians reached the second tour of presidential elections, and Volodymyr Zelensky received an unprecedented 73% of votes. This is a Ukrainian map the Russian lovers don't want to show you. And nobody calls pro-Russian Yanukovych back to Ukraine, except the general prosecutor's office demanding his arrest. Zelensky didn't show any sympathy for Russia during his election campaign, and campaign was also in Ukrainian, not in Russian language. Zelensky left Russian language in his old comedy sketches, and the Russian-speaking electorate voted for him. For example, in Mariupol, Zelensky received 91% of the votes. Russian language doesn't mean that people want to live in Russia and debunks all kinds of myths about a divided country. But thanks to that myth, Ukrainians are massively switching to Ukrainian from Russian to fuck Russia off. It is sufficient to know the history of Crimea, to know what Russia meant and means for Crimea, and Crimea for Russia. In Crimea, virtually everything is permeated with our history. Okay, Crimea is not Russian. It was occupied one day, yes, but it wasn't Russian all the time. It was at some point, and at some point it was not. And it was non-Russian a thousand years longer than it was Russian. There are European borders which have changed thousands of times throughout the history, and if each country wants territories that were once their own, then we will live in a chaos of endless wars. This is a very important uh, myth because what happened around the annexation of Crimea was for the first time since the Second World War the borders of the independent state were changed by force. But if we want to go deep in history then okay, we should say about Greeks and Tatars who lived on the peninsula and built their towns and states far earlier than Russia was even created, or about Ottoman Empire which controlled Crimea before Russian Empire. Also, Russia previously recognized Crimea as Ukrainian. Even more, Putin himself publicly recognized Crimea as a part of Ukraine. Крым не является никакой спорной территорией, и Россия давно признала границы сегодняшней Украины. It's hard to remember your own words when your brain consists of buttocks only. Referendum in Crimea was held according to all democratic norms and international laws. International law in Putin's mind is when armed masked men stay next to you and ask you to do something. For most countries, this procedure is called extortion, but for Russia, it is a referendum. You know, when you're Russian, you can go with a gun to any bank and take the money according to all democratic norms and international laws. Just say that this money is historically yours, because you've had it once. Russia's pressure is systemic and it is increasing. It is done in order to push people to never lift their heads, never to object to the occupational authorities or even better for them to force people to leave. If anyone was against this fake referendum, then Russian democratic norms allowed them to arrest and torture them indefinitely. It happened and happens to Crimean activists and local population like Crimean film director Oleg Sentsov, who didn't want to be occupied and was jailed for years. On a regular basis, we hear about new mass arrests and prison sentences for Crimean Tatars. Russians are doing it because these people really know the history of the peninsula and understand that the myth about historically Russian Crimea is complete bullshit. Kremlin leaders said Russia considered the treatment of ethnic Russians in Donbass region as genocide. In 2014, Russia also tried to use the Crimean scenario in Donbass and quickly occupied the Donetsk and Luhansk regions, but it didn't work because of the Ukrainian army. The only protests that were seen in Donbass were pro-Ukrainian. People came out to the streets not to welcome Russia, but to oppose the Russian invasion. Russia didn't give up its idea and began a proxy war by sending weapons and militias to these regions, and propaganda called them local rebels, but they were mainly Russian citizens, like FSB officer and the leader of terrorist Igor Girkin, who is now back to war as an ordinary Russian military officer. Girkin was among the three Russian nationals and one Ukrainian who was tried for mass murder in the Netherlands over the downing of MH17. 
The Dutch court handling the trial is expected to hand down its verdict next month. By the summer of 2014, the proxy war turned out to be simply a war between Russia and Ukraine. Russia started to use its regular army units without official markings, and they didn't care about civilians at all. Russians were shelling from residential areas, and when the Ukrainian army punched them back, Russian propaganda immediately screamed about Ukrainian shooting civilians. Such a simple manipulation gave birth to the famous myth about Ukraine that was bombing Donbas for eight years. You know, it's really strange that Russian language has the word truth in its vocabulary. There is a lot of evidence that debunked this myth, like the video from Occupied Luhansk that you just watched. You can easily hear how mortar shoots and a few seconds later bomb drops nearby. That means the mortar is nearby, inside the city, and Russians are shelling the territories they just occupied. We definitely need to do Shazam for shelling would be popular in Ukraine. Russians often use this method to accuse the Ukrainian army of killing civilians. This Russian fella fires at his own guys and laughs. His friend, the cameraman, asks the soldier to fire in the opposite side, where the Ukrainians could actually be, but the guy shoots towards his own positions, telling him that it's not time to sleep. In 2019, NGO Donbas Sauce made a survey about shelling in eastern Ukraine among civilians in Donetsk. People told the organization how Russians shelled from the residential areas and shot the same town they were in. Also, you can look at OSC reports that were tracking casualties among civilians since 2015, and you will find out that these numbers don't correspond with the myth about eight years of constant shelling. But if you are too lazy to search for this kind of information, just compare how Donetsk looks like after eight years of shelling and Mariupol after a few months of liberation by the Russian army. But of course, don't let facts cloud your arrogance. Did you know that Ukraine also supported Hitler? Like there's this threat of neo-Nazism within Ukraine and so Putin's claim is that he's trying to denazify Ukraine. Do you know who actually collaborated with Hitler? Russia. That is the USSR, which Putin misses so much and which Ukrainians hate anyway. I simply remind you that the Second World War began in 1939 with the invasion of Poland. Part of it was taken by Hitler, part of it was taken by USSR. At the, the time, Stalin attacked independent Finland and Romania. In 1940, the USSR occupied previously independent Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia. Russia officially collaborated with Hitler and occupied Europe. These are just facts. Soviet Russia started a war against Hitler only when Hitler started to bomb the territory of the USSR. Only after two years of common war, anti-European war, Russia became anti-Hitler. Ukraine was occupied by Soviets since 1919 and did not make any independent decisions. While Ukrainian territory was the main battlefield with Nazis, Ukrainian soldiers were the core of the resistance against Hitler, and Ukrainian nation is on the top list of those who suffered the most from both. Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia. Also, yes, there were Nazi collaborators in every Nazi-occupied country. Fun fact, Ukraine is among a few where the underground resistance were far more numerous, unlike France for instance, or as a matter of fact, Russia. Do you know what Russians are told about this at school? Nothing. Russians are convinced that the Second World War began in 1941 when the Nazis attacked Russia. As you know, the U.S. is sending high-powered military hardware to Ukraine, but what happens after it gets there? That is the concern, sources tell us. Western weapons are causing big problems for Russians on the battlefield, so they decided to interrupt their supply. To reach this goal, they created a myth that accused Ukraine of arms trafficking. Using social media, telegram channels, and some fake Western media, they spread information that Ukrainian militaries, for example, sell javelins on Darknet. Also, they claim that two French Caesars were sold to Russians. This topic was even caught up by some popular Western media like Guardian and CNN. As soon as the weapons are silent, um, criminals will try to benefit from the availability uh, of weapons. There are a lot of weapons available, not under control uh, uh, always, so we have to expect 
that these weapons will uh, be, be trafficked. Despite all Russian efforts, the myth about weapon smuggling didn't work. It was debunked numerous times by Vox Check, Atlantic Council, BBC and others like, for example, the guys who directly transfer weapons to Ukraine and see no problems. By the way, it makes so much sense for Ukrainian soldiers to sell Western weapons. They could receive 10,000 bucks and then just die without those weapons on the battlefield. And lose their country, the life of their family and friends. Seems like a fair trade, you know? Just last week, Russia's foreign minister warned the US that providing Ukraine with these type of weapons is an unacceptable escalation because they could hypothetically be used to strike Russia. Again, from 2014 to 2022, the Western world tried to speak with Russia from the diplomatic standpoint. And as a result, we received another stage of the war, more brutal, bloody and ruthless. If the world could learn something from these eight years is that Russia understands only power, especially military one. They not only understand it, but they fear it. Russians know their fears better than anyone, so they try to bluff and convince others that weapons should not be sent to Ukraine. They push myths about escalation, a war between the US and Russia, and even nuclear war. Well, in reality, Western weapons can only de-escalate the war, because with them the Ukrainian army is liberating our country and defending civilians from Russian aggression. These weapon systems have changed the course of the war for Ukraine. They've allowed the military to start pushing back, taking back lands as they have in the past few weeks. Did everyone forget how Russians retreated from Kyiv and Kharkiv? Why did they retreat? Because of Macron's call? Maybe some kind of diplomatic trick? Maybe because Greta Thunberg's tweet that the war spoils the nature? No, Ukrainians beat Russians. And there was no nuclear bombing. Russians just whined that it was a gesture of goodwill and that actually the defeat was their plan all along. Russians can explain any disaster to the Russian public, and Russians would believe, as they believe that gay people can make you gay with just a look in the eye. I don't know what the preconditions for peace might be, but I do know that naive notions that the Russians are going to lose somehow. During the early stages of this war, Ukrainians already destroyed the myth about the unstoppable Russian army, the myth that it is capable of capturing Ukrainian capital, Kyiv, only in three days. Despite that, some people still believe that Russia will win this war. They don't have any reasonable arguments and just say Russia can't lose the war because it's Russia. But if you are following the news from the battlefield, you will see that for several months Russians had no territorial gains, except for a few villages, which they were severely storming for a long time. On the other hand, the Ukrainian army conducted some successful counterattack operations and liberated a significant amount of territory. The reasons for this are the skill and motivation of Ukrainian soldiers combined with modern Western weapons. Russia doesn't have any answer for this, so they were just forced to start mobilization to save the situation. It doesn't look like a behavioral winner, uh, does it? It's impossible for Ukraine to win because uh, this is an existential battle for, for Putin. History knew a lot of examples when military powerhouses with nuclear weapons were defeated by smaller countries. For example, the US in the Vietnam War or USSR in Afghanistan. Ukraine can and will win this war on the battlefield, not by negotiations. Even if this is an existential battle for Putin, then, well, he will be destroyed, as well as all of this myth. Thank you, and see you next time.